SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. So today, uh, I'm honored to be able to introduce, introduce to you Maria Fitzpatrick. Many of you already know her. And, and she is um, discussing the, the uh, domestic violence and why we're silent about that uh, in our society. Uh, I've worked for over 20 years in this field and ha experienced the same kind of things that Maria will be talking about. She has shared this talk uh, in some other places and one of the significant places was in November of 2015 when she shared her talk and what had happened to her in the legislature. Uh, it takes a lot of courage and, and passion to, to talk about this issue. And so we're really um, uh, privileged to have Maria today talking to us about domestic violence. Why has the silence continued? So help me welcome Maria Fitzpatrick. <laughs> Okay, Tansy, bon appétit and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I too acknowledge that I am present on the traditional territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy and the Métis uh, people of Alberta, Region 3, past, present, and future. This presentation is my call to you for personal action to stop domestic violence, intimate partner violence, and gender-based violence. Tomorrow begins the 16 days of action uh, against gender-based violence. Awareness, action, and accountability. And for me, it is every day until it is no more. In this presentation, I will speak specifically about domestic violence. This is an uncomfortable topic, and it is more than uncomfortable for me. It is painful. Every time I speak about this, I have nightmares while I am doing my prep. As the horror of what had happened haunts me, and that's 40 plus years ago. I want you to feel uncomfortable so that you will understand that you and I have to be part of the solution. Uh, slide two. Um, okay. I'm not sure where I need to go. Yeah. Okay. So uh, my hope is that by hearing some of my story and this presentation, it will help you feel the emotion to take action during the 16 days of action against gender-based violence. Domestic silence. That was the title of Section B uh, insight of the Edmonton Journal the weekend before I shared my uh, story in the Alberta legislature. Um, and I wasn't supposed to be using props, uh, but I, I had taken my hearing aids out and I couldn't hear what the speaker was saying to me. Uh, but it was, domestic silence is an issue. I will share a little of my story so that you may understand why I must continue to speak up on this raging issue, which continues every day in this city, this province, in this country, and around the world. I will share some statistics, um, more statistics than I'd like to share, but I will share some, um, which possibly indicate an abuse, oh, the warning signs, which will possibly indicate uh, a, an abusive relationship. I will talk about why those being victimized find it difficult or impossible to leave. 
some ways, which research shows, would go a long way to stop domestic violence. And finally, what each of us can do to be part of the solution. My story. On September 4th, 1972, five days after I was married, I realized there was something wrong, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Words were spoken, and I felt a shiver run down my spine and had a knot in my stomach. And I can't remember what those words were, but I can still feel the shiver and the knot in my stomach. I didn't know it then, but the trap was being set and I was the game. That trap was released to some degree on Sunday, July 19th, 1981, almost nine years later, when my mother-in-law uh, brought my daughters and I to the Greyhound station um, for a very difficult 62-hour uh, journey across the country and ending up in Yellowknife, the Northwest Territories. The trap was finally broken in May of 1992 when I learned that my ex-husband had died two years before. I could finally stop looking over my shoulder. I stood in the Alberta Legislature in November 2015 to support Private Members Bill 204, an act to amend the Tenancies Act, which would support persons in domestic violence situations to break their lease. My support for that bill came from the middle of my nine-year experience in that trap, a trap that was intentionally or unintentionally supported by society. Silence, blame, guilt, and little to no support. Grew this injustice for decades, if not centuries. Three times I left with my kids. Twice I went to shelters. Twice I was forced to return to the abuse or live on the street. Both times I returned and the violence got worse and the threats, which he could have carried out at any time, more frequent and more intimidating. Broken bones, black eyes, sexual assault, and two miscarriages were the result of this ongoing abuse. Many times I prayed and asked God why this was happening to me and my kids. I am a good person and have never intentionally hurt anyone in my life or anything. Someone said to me, God helps those who help themselves. I knew I had to do something. I got away to a women's shelter and tried to figure out what to do and where to go. But I could only stay at the first women's shelter for two weeks. I was forced to return. The second time I left, I felt I was more prepared. I had managed to save and hide a little bit of money. I had called a lawyer, and when I saw a chance to run, we ran again. This time to a different shelter. This time we could stay for three weeks. But when I saw the lawyer, uh, we couldn't get a court date for a month. And again, we were forced to return or be on the street. The street probably would have been safer. This time, the abuse was so bad, I thought I would be killed, especially when I woke to a gun at the back of my head and the sound of the clicking of the hammer as he pulled the trigger. There were no bullets in the gun. He laughed hysterically. He beat me and raped me and said the next time there would be bullets and he threatened to kill our children in front of me to hurt me and then kill me. I knew it was just a matter of time before he would carry out these threats. As soon as I could, I called the police. He was arrested and two days later, the judge released him on his own recognizance. With a restraining order to stay away from me, the kids, the school, our home and my workplace. In the next 14 days, I called the police 16 times when he breached those conditions. He was finally arrested after he assaulted me again before a stranger intervened and the kids and I could run to safety. He was arrested and charged with 
breach of recognizance, and domestic violence. I asked family and some friends for some financial help so we could get out of there, but I still had to go back to court, or they would charge me. I told my story in court, which was backed up by the police reports of the bruising and the hair pulled out of the back of my head. He told the court that he had not touched me and that somebody else must have assaulted me. It was all I could do not to throw up right there in the courtroom. The judge convicted him on all charges and sentenced him to one year in jail. Then the judge suspended all of the sentence except for the time uh, he had spent in remand. He turned as he was leaving the courtroom and shouted that he would kill me. I asked the judge how he could let him go and the judge replied that it was a marital issue, get a divorce and leave. He then proceeded to give me a lecture about how much it would cost to keep him in jail. When I returned to my home, my ex was there holding my daughters and my mother, uh, mother-in-law at gunpoint. I thought we were going to die. After four hours, his mother rose and asked God to help us, and he ran out of the house. We barricaded the doors and windows and called the police. We remained in the house for several days before we could finally go and get on that Greyhound bus and run for our lives. This should not have, it have happened to my kids, myself, or anybody else. My kids, who are now uh, adults, have been scarred for their entire lives. Now for some statistics. Rates of, and I will highlight, police reported family violence against children and youth, intimate partners and seniors all rose in 2019. The overall rate of police reported family violence increased for the third consecutive year, rising 13% over that period. That followed several years of decline in numbers from 2009 to 2016. Statistics Canada released the Juristat article, Family Violence in Canada, a statistical profile in 2019, which presents an overview of police reported family violence against children and youth, intimate partners, and seniors. The onset of COVID-19 pandemic um, in Canada brought about, as you know, uh, closures, isolation, uh, and many job losses. And for many, that raised concerns over uh, the impact of these stressors on families and possible increase in family violence. While the latest annual uh, police reported data on family violence uh, predated the pandemic, they are uh, critical in being a baseline uh, established uh, so that you can look at uh, the, re I guess, the uh, fallout for families in Canada because of it. Some data has been collected during COVID-19 and uh, represents incident that came to the attention of police. However, the concern during COVID was that many victims might have been unable to reach out for help. Normally, a number of suspected or witnessed uh, cases uh, by a third party, friends, teachers, uh, would which normally would have been reported, would not have been reported during that time. One quarter of victims of police reported violent crimes are victimized by a family member. There were approximately 400,000 victims of police reported crime, violent crime, and that's all violent crime right across Canada in 2019. So of these one quarter, over 100,000 people were victimized by a family member, a spouse, a parent, a child, sibling, or extended family member who perpetrated that violence. 
Women and girls accounted for two-thirds of all the victims of family violence in 2019. Physical assault was the most uh, common type of uh, family violence reported to police, this affecting seven in 10 victims. More than half of child and youth victims of family violence were physically assaulted, as were about three quarters of seniors and intimate partners. Child and youth, intimate partner, and senior victims of family violence all experience higher rates of physical assault than other types of violence. There was one exception, and that is girls aged 17 and younger, who experienced a slightly higher rate of sexual offenses, including sexual assault and sexual violation against children, than physical assault. Personally, I would uh, question that given my own experience. Um, because I would suspect that victims uh, may be too embarrassed to share the details of that information. And in fact, even though uh, the one time the police came to the house, I had bruises from my knees to my groin, they never once asked me if I was sexually assaulted, which I had been. Rates are calculated on the basis of uh, 100,000 population, ages 15 to 89. Uh, and that population uh, estimates are done on July 1st. And the victim refers to uh, those aged 15 to 89. This first slide is on uh, family violence. The slide, uh, sorry, uh, and please note the data highlighted for 2019 shows the female victims were 363, male victims 183, and a total victim of 273. So I'm not sure what the discrepancy was in that slide. And the next slide is intimate partner violence. And this one shows in 2019, 536 female victims, 149 male victims, with a total of 344. Again, Again, I don't understand the discrepancy. Uh, I will find out, uh, but I wasn't able to find out before I uh, came to do this. Given that Lethbridge has a population of just over 100,000, these numbers would be pretty close uh, to our numbers here. And it does line up with the Lethbridge statistics. Uh, that scares the daylights out of me because we know a much larger proportion of family violence goes unreported. In fact, Shannon Hansen from the YWCA, when she came and uh, did a presentation here at SACPA, uh, she reported that our statistics at Harbor House show that only one in six of the people that we support ever have communication or report to the police for support. There are probably another 2,500 plus people in this community who are also being victimized by domestic violence. Uh, this slide uh, shows that, in fact, 586 uh, domestic violence cases in Lethbridge in 2019 and 1,825 cases were turned away from the shelter in southern Alberta. That's women, children, and seniors. Uh, what that means to us, according to Shannon, is that uh, Lethbridge is really a hotbed for domestic violence, and we really are a place that needs to work hard together as a community to solve uh, the problems that we face, including domestic violence. Uh, a presentation at the college on Tuesday, um, my daughter's taken some courses there and she attended this and shared it with me. A staff member at Harbor House reported that uh, last year, ending at the end of March uh, 2022, there had been 1,300 plus requests for shelter and over 700 were turned away. So far this year, uh, they have housed 400 plus 
and there are still four months remaining till the end of their fiscal year. Those being victimized in this city may well be your neighbor, your work colleague, or a friend. The perpetrator could also be your neighbor, your work colleague, or your friend. Now I'm going to talk about uh, the warning signs. Now I've just got, uh, I think I've got eight up there. Uh, so uh, some of the war these are warning signs that we should all be aware of. For instance, the six signs on this uh, slide, uh, two of which I added from my personal perspective, and after speaking to thousands of others, both female and male, who contacted me after I gave my statement in the Alberta legislature. And you can see the last two, which I really want to um, focus on, uh, a lack of respect for oneself and uh, for uh, your partner or family member. And the last, the last one up there was not valuing what one's partner or family member brings to a relationship. A relationship is about two people. It's not just one person or a group of people, it's two people. There's a copy of the warning signs on each table, and there's 25 identified. And if you would like a copy for yourself, please let me know after the presentation, and I will email it to you. However, I'm going to add one other thing, and that is your instinct. If something feels off, it probably is. Perhaps a comment that catches you, or that feeling in the pit of your stomach uh, when you see something. Please pay attention. Many of these warning signs are within a household, or where no one else can see or hear, uh, but sometimes they are visible to others. And it is important to pay attention to signs like, for instance, someone saying, something that humiliates uh, their partner. Or when you called and the phone said out of service, the abusive partner may have broken the phone or not paid the bill to isolate their partner. And certainly my ex did that. He wouldn't pay the phone bill so I couldn't uh, contact other people. Uh, it may just be out of service, but put things in context. When you visit their home or apartment, things may be broken, usually things belonging to the injured party. My ex took the nameplates off all my trophies, um, and when somebody came in and commented, they hadn't known I was an athlete as well, um, when his friend left, he blamed me for humil trying to humiliate him, even though he was the one who put my trophies in his trophy case behind his. Then he proceeded to break them all. Gaslighting is a form of psychological manipulation in which the abuser uh, attempts to sow self-doubt and confusion in the victim's mind. Typically, gaslighters are seeking to gain power and control over the other person by distorting reality and forcing them to question their own judgment and intuition. Domestic violence is many times a slow process with little things happening, which don't seem like a big deal at the time. Like the phone being off or complaining about your friends or your family and not wanting to be around them and for you not to be around them either. These are tools in the abuser's arsenal. Domestic violence is about control and domination. This signal for help, what does this mean? The social isolation me uh, measures necessitated by COVID-19 pandemic uh, are making it more difficult for those who are at risk of abuse or violence to safely reach out for help. 
Signal for help is a simple one-hand sign someone can use on a video call uh, or driving by in a car and using it in the window. Okay, five minutes and I've got a lot to do. Um, so I'd like you to uh, remember that and if you see it, there's a reason that it's there. The signal for help is a tool that may help some people some of the time. Some people do not have the ability to make those video calls, so keep your eyes open. I'm skipping past here. Um, there's some ways that you could safely check in if somebody gives you that call. Call them and ask questions that can be answered with a yes or no answer. Uh, would you like me to call 911? Would you like me to call a shelter on your behalf? Um, should I look for uh, some services that might help you? If you have to use another form of communication, for instance, uh, send an email or a text, ask how you're doing. Other questions you can ask. Do you want me to reach out to you regularly? So there's things that you can do. Focus on the person being hurt. Your job is to support them. Make sure you are not putting your anger, shock, sadness, or fear first in the conversation. Everyone copes with abuse differently. Uh, they may do nothing, uh, or they may do uh, things differently than you do. Be patient and listen and let them lead instead of telling them what they should do. Be judgment free. Instead of saying, what did you do? Ask them how they are and what you can do to help. And I'm afraid I'm skipping through some of this, even though it's pretty important. Why doesn't the victim just leave? I will speak to my experience specifically. Uh, fear, shame, erosion of self-esteem, being told no one would believe me. I didn't want to put anyone else in jeopardy. If I told them, it would have. Believing the negative message he had been giving me throughout our marriage, he told me no one else would want me or another man's kids, especially not my black kids. I was a bad mother, which he often used to provoke a reaction from me. All the problems in our relationship were my fault because I would not do what he told me to do, and the list goes on. Everyone who experiences domestic violence has different reasons uh, for leaving, for staying. I left when he threatened to kill my kids. The fog of the negative messages dissipated when I started working, and my boss gave me more and more responsibilities and then offered to send me to Northwestern University to finish my degree in orthotics and prosthetics. My brain was finally clear enough to realize the threats that he would kill the kids and I would be fulfilled if we stayed. He still may do that if we left, but the chance was lessened. A friend told me I could leave, survive, and thrive, and so would the kids. Friends and family helped me, especially my mother-in-law, Rosie, my uh, sister and brother, my boss, and my co-workers all put themselves on the line for me. Uh, the rest is about preventing violence, which I think is pretty important, but Mary tells me I don't have any time left, so maybe somebody can ask some questions about that. Thank you. You're right, uh, Maria, that's, that's always disturbing to hear. I've heard many of those stories before, too, from other people and also from Maria. I remember her sitting uh, across an office and telling me their story early in, in, in our relationship. So now's the time for a question and answer. Uh, we'd ask you to line up here. I see it's kind of crowded a little bit there, uh, but that's the best place to, to gather. Uh, state your name when you have the mic and, and uh, briefly, and uh, have a brief question. Uh, no, don't pontificate. Uh, and. Uh, Maria will be here and will answer your questions and uh, and uh, they'll spark some more, I'm sure. 
Thank you, Maria. That was very, very touching. Go closer to the mic, please. To closer to the mic? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah, my question is about battered spouse syndrome. Could you say a little bit about battered spouse syndrome and, and co the complications and how to try and solve that, uh, that dilemma? Okay, so the battered wife syndrome is, uh, there are three stages. One is uh, uh, when uh, the wife gets battered, and then there's uh, the honeymoon stage when uh, the spouse apologizes, it's never going to happen again, and then the next part is the build-up to the next uh, battering. Um, now there are lots of theories on where you can uh, break the domestic violence cycle, uh, but personally I think that um, when, uh, when you meet somebody, and certainly when I met uh, Herman, he presented himself to be one person. And everything that I heard about him uh, kind of uh, supported uh, what I thought or who I thought he was. But once we were married, uh, things started to change, and I thought that I was just imagining things. And then the first time he hit me, I was about uh, seven months pregnant with uh, Selena. And um, I had never seen anybody hit anybody else other than, you know, the, the wrestling matches on TV. But I'd never actually seen anybody hit anybody. And I, I was in shock. I went in the bathroom, locked the door, and uh, just started to cry. And he kicked the door in. And he was crying, and uh, he apologized. I think that had I reached out at that point uh, to seek some help, uh, that maybe it could have stopped then, but uh, I, I thought it was a one-off. I didn't think this was something that was going to continue. And initially, it was, uh, the abuse didn't happen on a regular basis, at least that physical abuse wasn't. But he often um, said things to me in front of other people and at home that uh, made me feel humiliated. And I couldn't understand why, if you love somebody, why would you do that? So how do you stop that? And when you talk about preventing uh, domestic violence, uh, uh, and I've got it on the handout sheet, uh, learning about um, or having available mental health uh, supports and learning to be resilient, uh, I think are a, a very big step. Um, learning how to have safe, positive relationships. And I don't, I mean, I watched my mom and dad and they had a, a wonderful relationship for over 49 years when my dad died. And how, like, why wasn't I having a relationship like that? So I think there was a piece missing uh, right there in terms of, uh, should I be learning something in school? Should I be learning something when I was going to church? Should somebody have talked to me about uh, that, um, that piece? Um, but that kind of brings me to uh, another part, and that is uh, our kids. And teaching our kids, again, about safe relationships, about being safe online. There's links on each of the, um, on the handout that I'd really like you to go and have a look at so that you can learn more about preventing domestic violence. So Mark, I hope that answers your question. Well, <laughs> thank you, Maria. I wrote it down. Thanks for sharing your horrific story. And I think you're very brave to share your experience. I have to. Thank you. So looking at the list of the abuse signs, it's clear that this is rooted in misogyny to keep women in control and subject to their husband's rule. And in Canada, this has been supported by political rules such as <clears throat> uh, women not being able to have own their own property or uh, have bank accounts or have the right to vote. And in Canada, we've overcome some of these. But, <clears throat> but the very programs that could reduce this violence have been cut 
by the UCP government, such as the parenting program at the college, uh, enough teachers in the school system, and mental health workers, because some of the, the children who are abused go, often go on to be abusers. So my question to you is, you said the last thing in your, in your talk you couldn't talk about, how, c how can we strengthen our society against these cultural norms that are still implicit there and implicit in many religious groups. How can we change things? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm be gonna begin with um, a comment. Uh, do you know what the rule of thumb is? And in fact, a friend of mine sent me an email this week about it. Um, the rule of thumb was that a man couldn't beat his wife with a stick larger than his thumb. Now that's a societal uh, ingrain that was um, prevalent from uh, around 1400 uh, AD. The thing is, things haven't necessarily changed a whole lot. Um, when, uh, for me, I can't, I can't abide uh, somebody feeling that they can dictate how I should feel or how I should think. And you know I speak up and I say things when that happens. But the reality is I was brought up in a home with five girls and one boy. And my dad encouraged us to speak up and talk about the issues that were going on. Uh, my mom always spoke up and I always thought my mom was the dominant person in our family. But in fact a friend of mine said, no, 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 your mom's not. Your mom speaks and says her mind until your dad says, Rita. <laughs> and that still goes on. So as long as that goes on, the feeling of respect, and my mom never talked about this, but I certainly felt if somebody said that to me, my inclination would be then to shout out as loud as I could. But as a society, we need to think about what we say to other people. We need to challenge when other people say things that, like I said, kind of raises the hair in the back of your neck or it feels uncomfortable. Say something, please say something because we all have a responsibility to stop it. This week when uh, council debated uh, the police funding, I don't disagree that they need more funding, that they need more police officers, but I never heard one word about adding some psychologist or some uh, mental health therapist or uh, to add uh, a social worker anywhere in that budget for the police department. And you know what? They need somebody who does that. I worked in corrections for over 30 years. I had lots of violent offenders on my caseload. I didn't have an issue with any of them. There were lots of times that ra voices got raised and uh, an offender came in to see me and was angry and I could have been at risk. But I listened to what they had to say. What was the issue that was um, making them feel so out of control that they were angry? Why were they so frustrated? You have to listen, and you have to take some action when you listen. Hope that answers your question, Bev. Thank you. you need help with the mic? <laughs> Good. Thanks. Thanks very much, Maria, for your, your um, thought-provoking pr um, presentation. So I have two questions. Um, one, in your research and experience, have you come across the, another technique of triangulation? So an example might be, particularly when children are very young, uh, in, the, uh, in the marriage, um, that the uh, abusive partner somehow triangulates um, with the child or the children to, um, you know, go against the, the other parent. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, of course, even if the marriage 
um, dissolves, that triangulation can still occur. So I'm just wondering if you can comment about that. And the second would be, um, you know, just uh, you'd mentioned that you didn't have time to uh, speak to a few important things. So if you could uh, speak to uh, one of those. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Laurie. So um, when uh, we returned, when we went back after staying at the first uh, women's shelter, uh, Herman took the girls and he drove around um, everywhere in our neighborhood to try to figure out where the um, uh, shelter was. Now we had gone to the shelter and it was night, uh, but the girls did recognize some of the neighborhood. And he took them, he must have had them in the car for three hours driving around until he found where the shelter was. So uh, he went into the, like he tried to get into the shelter, they had to call the police, but then when I needed to go to a shelter again, I couldn't go back to that shelter because uh, he'd already done that with the kids. Um, Selena was um, eight when we left. She had just turned eight. And Michelle was uh, four and she turned uh, five in October after we left. And um, Selena's almost 50 and she does not remember uh, specifically anything that happened uh, when we were living with him. She doesn't remember him. Uh, Michelle, who was much younger, remembers him and remembers some of the uh, things that had happened. But uh, Michelle was in uh, an abusive relationship for almost 20 years and has just in this past year finally gotten out of it. And all I could do, as much as I wanted to drag her out, was I had to wait till she made that decision. I made sure I put supports in place to help her out. I talked to her all the time about how unhealthy it was for her and her daughter. But in terms of him uh, trying to um, uh, make me look bad, uh, the girls weren't there, or he didn't try it, I don't know. Uh, but I certainly talked to other women who were in the shelters, and many of the women that, um, and men, who called me uh, after I spoke in the legislature, and many of them said that that's what happened. And if the kids were quite young, they didn't understand that their mom <coughs> or their dad was bad. And I never, ever said to my kids their dad was bad, never. Now that they're adults, we talk about his behavior and they've reconnected with their stepsisters, they've talked about it. But I never badmouthed him. He was the one that made those kids with me. And I, I can't, as, as bad as it was, I cannot um, uh, badmouth him to the girls because then I'd be telling them they were bad too, and they're not. So uh, other people who've talked about it, um, uh, they've talked about how they could deal with it, and the biggest thing they can do is uh, for the kids to have counseling. So mental health, mental health, mental health. Uh, I can't say it enough. And what we can do is we can lobby and insist that all level of governments uh, support, uh, greater uh, support in mental health. We know we've got a health care crisis. We don't even know how bad the mental health uh, crisis is. So 2,500 plus people could be using mental health. And then probably 5,000 because the person who's perpetrating needs that mental health uh, support as well. That's about the right setting for you, but get close, <laughs> get close, closer, yeah, there you are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria, for presenting this wonderful uh, information, and my name is Dan Kordakowski. Um, what I want to say is that I experienced a lot of trauma in my life. Um, basically, I grew up in a situation where my father ended up beating my mom and uh, it was very continuously 
every week I would have him go to the bar and come home and my parents would be involved in a dispute and I remember putting the pillow over my head and wishing that I would uh, not hear anymore and uh, uh, I guess you could basically say that my father and I um, ended up patching up the wounds many years ago and unfortunately he took his life in um, 2007 so that's a hard but um, so my mom ended up leaving him sorry my mom left him in the when I was 16 years old so coming from a divorce is always hard but my mom ended up re rejoining a different relationship where her next partner was a jail I use the term loosely a jailbird because he's been in jail and um, he ended up beating on her and um, when she was in Ontario and I says would you like me to fly to Ontario she says no no and uh, so then I ended up um, getting into a situation where my mom ended up arguing with him and um, he had a frying pan and he was going to hit me with it and I just stood like this and I says go ahead do it if you need to go ahead and then he held it closer and I said once again go ahead if you really need to go ahead and he slammed the frying pan down and the next morning he ended up getting an altercation with me now needless to say I took my anger out on him and he chased me out of the house with a hammer and smashed every single window out of my car I ran down the street in socks and, and no shoes and flagged for help and the police ended up coming to the house and victim services helped out hugely and I stayed at a week at a friend's house and uh, I made sure that my mom was going to be safe and uh, I, you know I just wish that my mom would have taken the suit and tie guy, the police officer, the lawyer, the plumber, the mechanic, whatever, instead of somebody that was in this position. And, uh, but my mom, unfortunately, she passed away from cancer in the year 2012. So she was my best friend. Cut a long story short, is that I lost my best friend. Now, I married my wonderful wife, Veronica, and uh, she has a great family as well. And uh, just to know, I, I just want to say this, is no matter what situation you're in, um, like Maria said, it's if something's going to put hairs up on your neck, there's a reason why. So get out of that situation, look for help, and don't be afraid to ask for help. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan, for sharing uh, your personal story as a child in a domestic uh, violence situation. Sarah. Hi. Hi, Maria. Um, my name is Sarah Amies. Thank you, Maria. Thank you as well for your incredible honesty and the bravery it takes to, to speak those words. Um, so having read the um, list of warning signs for um, domestic violence and having the hair go back up on one's neck, do you have any suggestions for folks who feel they might suspect that something is going on either with a colleague or a friend or a relative and because of the shame and the silence and the trauma, do you have any suggestions for folks who do suspect um, as to how they might approach a person and deal with that situation? Uh, thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, you need to check in. You need to be judgment free. You need to be, um, you need to find out what they need. And they may say, oh, I just need to go out and have a cup of tea or something. Go out and have a cup of tea, but continue to check in. And eventually when they know that you're safe and that it's okay to share what's going on, they will. 
uh, you, anybody who's in that situation, you have to reach a point where you're able to talk about it. And it doesn't come easy because, um, as you said, the guilt and the shame, it's like, okay, I'm a, a reasonably smart person. Uh, I'm able to look after myself. Why did I let that happen? Those are questions I can ask me, but nobody else should be asking me. Other people should be asking me, what can I do to help you? Would you like to share what's going on? But you have to be open and you have to reach out because they may not reach out to you. Uh, I'm Ian Hurdle. Uh, Maria, thanks for being a tough lady. A little closer. A little closer. <laughs> thanks for being a tough lady. Now, in my lifetime, this has uh, gone from a taboo topic that nobody ever discussed anywhere, I don't think. Mm -hmm. and. We now have quite a bit of information on it. In my work lifetime as a surgeon, I've watched the injured kids, uh, and sometimes it was the nurse's hairs on the back of her neck that went up, and just didn't fit right. And I've uh, escorted quite a few children out of the back doors of hospitals <laughs> over the years uh, with a social worker getting them the hell out of town. Uh, for the women, I've watched people become much more aware and saying, you know, this wrist fracture isn't the sort of normal fall. Somebody twisted the hell out of you or, you know, you didn't get the cauliflower ears because you slipped pushing the shopping cart. <laughs> yeah. um, so. The, I, I, it's nice to be aware of it. And what I found is the kids we could sneak away and hide and somebody didn't necessarily be there. But I found for the women, it was really difficult to isolate them if the guy was around for them to admit anything. I think we've gotten better at it because of education. I always found the worst thing was the financial insecurity that they had no way to get away. Thanks. If it hadn't have been uh, for my family, uh, my boss, uh, and my friends who gave me money to get out of there, I couldn't have. Uh, I worked. Well, in fact, I worked uh, two jobs and sold at home uh, so I could pay the rent, I could buy the groceries. And, uh, but I was um, nickel and dime in my groceries so that I could put some money and I was hiding it at work because I couldn't hide it at home because he'd find it and take it. So certainly financial security is, is one thing. But when I was at uh, one of the uh, shelters, there was a woman there whose husband was a lawyer. And um, I thought, well, you know, she lives in a nice house and here I am being judgmental. And I thought, well, she should have some money. He took care of every cent. She did not have a nickel to call her own. So yes, I, kids in school should learn about personal financial security. And that was one thing my, my mom did uh, preach to us and my dad did preach to us, is you have to be able to look after yourself and you have to be uh, resilient to a certain degree. But you know you need to pay to keep a roof over your head, you need to buy groceries, you need to pay bills. So what do you need to do? So getting an education. Kids need to get an education, and I'm telling you, uh, it's an argument in, in our house all the time about my grandson, who's an adult, who is smart as a tack and wouldn't go on to university. Uh, he needs to go on. He needs to be able to support his daughter. And I said, you can do the job that you like doing, but you have to earn a decent living so you can pay. But women need 
money to be able to support them. And I'm telling you, there's not one level of government that provides enough money for uh, women to be able to support themselves and get out of those situations. So places like Harbor House, the uh, Alberta Council on Women's Shelters, that provide some secondary housing, they help the women to get jobs and to get on their feet. Because if you're not on your feet, you're going back again because you don't have any choice or you're on the street. So uh, I really appreciate that. Financial security is huge, uh, but safety is first. Leona. Leona Jacobs. So about, this, this might be tangential to sort of the, the path this talk has taken, but related. Um, so about 20-ish years ago, um, Mark, my late partner, was involved in the domestic violence action team, which was part of the police services thing. Yes. And so I wondered if you want, it, like, I guess my curiosity is where is that now and and what what interventions are they having and how would you factor that into your talk? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, where that is right now. Uh, as you know publicly, uh, one of the members of that team who moved on to be on the uh, board of a, another group that helps women uh, was uh, charged by somebody that he was supposed to be helping. And uh, I won't comment further on that, but what it has done is it has eroded the trust of women who uh, are in these situations to go and talk to the police. Certainly if it's a female officer that they're talking to, they're more, much more likely to talk to it, but uh, you can't send um, just a female officer into a domestic dispute. You need to have a male officer there as well. Um, and I'm not saying that uh, the woman isn't, the female officer isn't able to deal with it, but uh, the perpetrator sees another woman. And if they're in a position where they're a perpetrator, women are less than. So uh, I would like to see um, uh, a domestic violence uh, team with the police that the community can trust and that in fact they do things that um, uh, bring the, the victim to uh, a safe place and the supports that needed to be around that person are there. I'm tell you have no idea how difficult it was for me to find a lawyer who would represent me in a divorce case. And in fact, even though I went to court, I couldn't go and get a divorce until I went to uh, Yellowknife. And when I went to Yellowknife, I filed from there. And of course, the day I'm going to court, that same, uh, or the day before in Toronto, uh, domestic violence case in Toronto, uh, the husband came into the courtroom, killed the lawyer, and killed um, his partner who had filed charges against him. So um, as a society, we have a lot of work to do. But the first thing you have to do is you have to listen and pay attention. And if you see something, do something. It may be just reaching out. It may be yelling fire to break what's going on at the moment. Uh, with the signal for help, um, kids at a mall who are with a parent who's abusing them may give that sign. For me, I'd go and I'd drop something in front so that I stop them and uh, give an opportunity to have a conversation with that, uh, even if it's just a couple of words but to break what's going on right now, uh, to find out, to check in, uh, to see what's going on.